Welcome back. Iranian women's rights campaigner Nargis Mohammadi has been announced as the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Committee says that she received the prize for her fight against the oppression of women in Iran and her efforts for promoting human rights and freedom for all. More than 350 people and groups were nominated for the prestigious prize given for the promotion of peace. Hello to my colleagues and friends in Amnesty. Today, I can send this video message to you and without your protection, it wouldn't have been possible. I hope one day to be able to tell you that execution have stopped in Iran and that women in my country have got their rights and that we have a better human rights situation in Iran. My goal is to achieve peace and human rights. I am determined to try more than before. I'm sure with our efforts, perseverance in Iran and with your human rights colleagues' protections, we will win all together for peace and human rights. Uh, on this point. And in yes. reacting to the Nobel Peace Prize announcement, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights says that the award to jail, jailed activist Najis Mohammadi highlights the courage and the determination of Iranian women. According to the spokesperson Elizabeth Trossel, the world has seen their courage and determination in the face of reprisals, intimidation, violence and detention. What is absolutely clear is that the women of Iran have been a source of inspiration for the world. We've seen their courage and determination in the face of reprisals, intimidation, violence and detention. This, uh, this courage, this determination has been remarkable. They've been harassed for what they do or don't wear. Um, there are increasingly stringent legal, social and economic measures against them. So we would absolutely say that this really um, is something that really highlights the courage and determination of the women of Iran and how they are an inspiration to the world. Meanwhile, the European Union's 27 national leaders have held a roundtable in the framework of an informal meeting in Grenada, Spain. While they look to, for ways to avoid a new migration crisis, addressing a longer-term existential challenge of bringing into their bloc new countries, potentially as big and troubled as Ukraine. The 27 are also expected to discuss the strategic path for the EU after years marred by crisis, from the COVID pandemic to the Russian war in Ukraine to the 2022 energy crunch and marked by challenges including climate change and economic rivalry with China. From economic aid transfers to decision making to maintaining cohesion, the EU leaders will look on Friday at what needs to change inside their union to allow for another enlargement. While upon arrival to that meeting, AU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen spoke of issues hoping to be tackled at the meeting. The better we are with legal pathways and humanitarian corridors, the stricter we can be and have to be with the return of those who are not eligible for asylum. Because one thing must also be very clear, we have our international obligations we will fulfill them. We have done that in the past. We do this now. But we as Europeans will decide who comes to Europe and under what circumstances and not the smugglers and traffickers. And for the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban slammed the EU's handling of immigration and the enlargement of the bloc. Prime Minister Orban says that although the EU pushed through with its migration proposal, Hungary and Poland are not satisfied with it. Asked about Georgia's candidacy to join the EU, Orban deemed it to be enlargement fatigue, calling the leaders selfish. Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas said that although her country supports all candidates to join the EU, nobody is expected to have any discounts in this regard. There is no agreement on immigration because previously we decided that migration will be uh, regulated on a unilaterally agreement basis, which was changed last meeting. Poland and Hungary was not satisfied with the proposal, but they pushed us. 
through, I mean push through the proposal. So Hungary and Poland was totally left out of that. So after this, there is no any chance to have any kind of compromise and agreement on uh, migration. Politically, it's impossible. Not today, generally speaking, for the next years, you know, because, because legally we are, uh, how to say it, we are raped. So if you are raped legally, forced to accept something what you don't like, how would you like to have a compromise and agreement? It's impossible. We have been supporting all the countries that really want to uh, join European Union uh, if they do uh, the necessary reforms and take the steps like, like we did. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, very difficult reforms that we had to do. Uh, it uh, required uh, a lot of uh, um, will from the public to, to endure this, uh, but uh, we did it and, and I think you know nobody is expected to have any any uh, discounts in this regard. Well, it seems that EU leaders are one step closer to adopting a common migration strategy after reaching a deal on how to deal with asylum seekers in times of crisis. And to discuss more about this agreement and why the issue of migration is so divisive in the EU right now, I'm being joined by DW's Kate Ferguson in Berlin for more. Hello, Kate, and good to have you. Uh, let's begin with you talking to us about what's been agreed by these leaders. So EU leaders have agreed on a series of proposed reforms that would go into effect in times of crisis. So in other words, at times when the number of asylum seekers arriving in a particular country is extraordinarily high. And in such a situation, a government could ask other member states for three things. Now, the first would be to take some of the new arrivals in themselves. The second would be to help process their cases. And the third, if they don't want to do either of those two things, would be to offer financial assistance, specifically 20 thousand euros for each person. Now, Germany and Italy had originally been in strong disagreement about the terms of these reforms. And one of the things that was a big source of contention was the role of humanitarian missions like rescue boats on the Mediterranean. Many of them are run by German organizations, but Italy blames them for encouraging people to make those unsafe journeys. Now, the proposals that have just been agreed don't consider these rescue boats as contributing to a crisis situation. And that could be one reason why German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has given it a particularly warm welcome. As I said, though, this is an agreement on proposed reforms. They would still need to be debated at Parliament level. And to be honest, it could be years before any changes actually go into effect. But still, it is progress on a very contentious issue. But why is this such a big topic in the European Union right now? So the number of people arriving on European shores by boat has increased this year, albeit not maybe by quite as much as some of the headlines might suggest. But the situation in some places, for instance, on the Italian island of Lampedusa, has been really dramatic, mainly because of an increase in arrivals from Tunisia. We actually saw around 8,000 people arriving there in just the space of three days in September. And some of the images from there have reminded people here in Europe of the migration crisis in 2015, when the EU was totally overwhelmed, when millions of asylum seekers, mainly fleeing the war in Syria, as well as conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, arrived. Now, the situation at the moment is nothing like that. There have been between 200 and 250,000 arrivals of asylum seekers so far this year. But the issue is that some countries bear much more of a burden dealing with migration overseas than others do. And there's been very little agreement on how to deal with this. This is a really divisive issue and it is not going to go away. Well, Kate, how could this deal affect European elections, which will be taking place next year? I think the struggle to agree on a common migration policy is really symbolic of a broader problem that the EU has in reconciling its ideals with the reality on the ground. Now, on the one hand, this is a block of 27 countries that are supposed to have shared values. But in reality, it's also a group of nations with competing national interests. And this is apparent in all kinds of areas, but it's especially obvious when it comes to migration. Now, as I mentioned already, Germany and Italy have some key disagreements on this issue. But you also have some countries like Poland and Hungary that have really resisted calls for more burden sharing. And even in Germany, which has often taken the lead in welcoming refugees, concerns about the effect of migration have fueled the rise of the, the far right alternative for Germany party.
Now, these hardline parties have capitalized on the perceived failures of the EU to deal with migration. And I think if a deal could be reached before those European elections next year, it would really help create the impression that the EU is capable of taking action and reaching consensus in key areas. If not, though, I think it would be just another issue to fuel the arguments of those far right Eurosceptic parties who say the EU is not fit for purpose and that these matters should be addressed at national level instead. So I think EU elections are often a test of the EU project itself. And in that way, I think the stakes here are pretty high. All right. Thank you very much. GW's Kate Ferguson from Berlin. Thanks a lot for your time on the World's Day. And still on migration issues, but this time in the United States, President Joe Biden is under fire from both Republicans and Democrats after his administration announced new border wall construction in Texas. Mr. Biden said that he was unable to stop the work because the funding was signed off while President Donald Trump was president. Former president, uh, members of his Democratic Party said that walls did not work, while rival Republicans accused him of hypocrisy. Some 20 miles, that's about 32 kilometers of barriers, will be built in a sparsely populated stretch of the Rio Grande Valley. While campaigning for presidency in 2020, Mr. Biden promised that he would not build another foot of wall if elected. He also added that it was not a serious policy solution to be president of all America, including three million American citizens living in Puerto Rico. I'm not going to steal the money that desperately needed to reconstruct the island in order to build a wall along the border that does nothing to keep Americans safe. Meanwhile, analysts say that President Joe Biden's shift on the border wall is neither a reversal nor a solution to the migration crisis. Former acting director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, John Sandweg, believes the ability to get the migrants through the immigration court system and hear asylum claims and then remove them from the United States is a challenge which fencing will not solve. But by and large, the, the primary problem remains not our ability to apprehend people who enter the United States unlawfully, but our ability to process them on the back end, our ability to get them through the immigration court system, to hear their asylum claims and then to remove them from the United States. That has been the challenge. And obviously, fencing is not going to solve that challenge. The fencing is on the U.S. side. My point is that the migrants can still cross the river, get their two feet in American soil and make that asylum claim. As we see more and more diverse nationalities come to the border, um, apprehending them and processing them becomes more difficult because uh, we may have limited or no repatriation agreements with their country of origin. Uh, but we also have an increased number of people who are asking for asylum. And once on U.S. soil and apprehended, they have that right to ask for asylum and, then, and you know, then have to be processed as such. Um, sometimes with an NTA, a notice to appear in, into immigration court court and then other times through other processing mechanisms. Um, so there's kind of a compilation of factors that go into what we're seeing. The New York City Mayor Eric Adams is calling for immigration reforms in the U.S. during a visit to Mexico. Mr. Adams is on a four-day tour of Latin America to learn how the main routes taken by migrants arriving the United States haven't. But according to Mr. Adams, some 100,000 migrants have arrived in New York City. The city has spent some 12 billion U.S. dollars in additional spending to address migration challenges. Adams's tour will continue in Quito and Bogota, ending with a visit in the Darien Pass, his schedule to return to New York on Sunday. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinking, is also in Mexico with Attorney General Mary Garland, where they have met with local officials to boost collaboration on issues such as migration, drugs and arms trafficking and security. The meeting was attended by Mexican Foreign Minister Alicia Barcenas and Mexican Security Minister Rosa Isela Rodriguez. Both countries stated their commitments against drug trafficking, with Mr. Blinken calling for a safe and secure border between both countries. We have to confront the synthetic drug epidemic as a public health crisis. That's what it is, a central focus of the 100-plus country coalition, global coalition, that we put together earlier this year. We'll consider what more we can do uh, to bring justice uh, and bring to justice the criminal networks who profit from violence and suffering on both sides of our border. 
and we'll discuss how we can continue to enhance border and port security while facilitating legitimate travel and trade between us. We are now uh, our largest trading partners, uh, and this is an extraordinary benefit to both of our countries. But we want to make sure that our border is also safe and secure. But I want to start by reiterating my thanks for the extradition of Ovidio Guzman Lopez from Mexico to the United States just three weeks ago. His extradition is a powerful symbol of what we can accomplish when we work together. We recognize that Mexican law enforcement and military service members lost their lives in securing his arrest. We are grateful for their courage and for their sacrifice. Well, Turkey's military says that it has neutralized 26 Kurdish militants in northern Syria overnight in retaliation of a rocket attack on the Turkish base. The defense ministry made this known when the conflict escalated nearly a week after a bomb attack in Ankara. Turkey typically uses the term neutralized to mean killed. The rocket attack on the base by the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia killed one Turkish police officer, wounding seven others and soldiers in the northwest Syrian state of Dabik area on Thursday. The defense ministry said that Turkey separately conducted airstrikes, destroying 30 militant targets elsewhere in northern Syria, including an oil well, a storage facility, and shelters. The outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, claimed responsibility for Sunday's bombing in Ankara that left the two attackers dead, wounding two police officers. And Turkey has said the attackers came from Syria, but the Syrian SDF forces have denied this claim. In the meantime, the Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder has said the U.S. Defense Secretary had a fruitful phone call with his Turkish counterpart to discuss what he calls a regrettable incident where the United States had to shoot down an armed Turkish drone. And this will be the first time that Washington has brought down an aircraft of NATO ally Turkey. But the Turkish UAVs had been carrying out airstrikes in Hasaka, and that's in Syria, on Thursday morning, about one kilometers away from U.S. troops. A few hours later, a Turkish drone came within less than a half kilometer of U.S. troops and was deemed a threat, and it was shot down by F-16 aircraft. Earlier today, Secretary Austin spoke by phone with Turkish Minister of National Defense Yasar Guler to discuss Turkish activity in proximity to U.S. forces in Syria. The Secretary reaffirmed that the United States remains in Syria exclusively in support of the campaign to defeat ISIS. The Secretary also acknowledged Turkey's legitimate security concerns and underscored the importance of close coordination between the United States and Turkey to prevent any risk to U.S. forces or the global coalition's defeat ISIS mission. You know, Turkey uh, is one of our strongest and most valued uh, NATO allies, and that, that partnership continues and will continue. Uh, so this is certainly a regrettable incident. Um, at approximately 7.30 local time in Syria today, uh, our, our forces had observed UAVs conducting airstrikes in the vicinity of Hasaka, Syria, uh, some of those strikes were inside a declared U.S. restricted operating zone, uh, or, or ROZ, near Hasaka, uh, and were approximately a kilometer away from U.S. forces who relocated to bunkers. At approximately 11.30 local time, a Turkish UAV uh, re-entered the ROZ on a heading toward where U.S. forces were located. Uh, U.S. commanders assessed that the UAV, which was now less than a half a kilometer from U.S. forces, to be a potential threat, and U.S. F-16 fighters subsequently shot down the UAV in self-defense uh, at approximately 11.40 local time. It's important to point out that no U.S. forces were injured during the incident. We have no indication that, uh, that, the, uh, that Turkey was intentionally targeting U.S. forces. How striking is it? I mean, Turkey is a NATO ally. And is this the first time that you can recall that a uh, NATO ally has had to shoot down the aircraft of another NATO partner? Yeah, I think, again, uh, it's a regrettable uh, incident, but uh, U.S. commanders on the ground did assess that there was a potential threat. And so they took prudent action uh, in this scenario. But again, the secretary has talked to his counterpart. Uh, they had the opportunity to have a fruitful conversation and again, uh, commit to one another that the U.S. and Turkey will continue to closely communicate and coordinate. 
And, and as I mentioned, Turkey does remain a very important and valuable uh, NATO ally and partner to the United States. Well, we're getting to the final stretch of the program. And after the break, Dubai's Alwa Sil Dome in the UAE breaks Guinness World Records with the largest interactive light show. Bring you the details. Welcome back. Zimbabwe's government has introduced restrictions to control a cholera outbreak that is suspected to have killed more than 100 people. The measures include suspending some social gatherings and restricting the number of people allowed to attend funerals in areas affected by this outbreak. Shaking hands and the serving of food at funerals have all been banned. The health ministry had on Wednesday announced 100 suspected cholera deaths, 30 of which had been confirmed through laboratory tests. Zimbabwe is prone to frequent cholera outbreaks and one of its worst outbreaks, so between 2008 and 2009, killed more than 4,200 people, infecting nearly 100,000 others. Rescue operations have entered the third day after flash floods in India's northeastern state of Sikkim left over 100 people missing. Officials say at least 22 people, including seven soldiers, have died in this disaster. The massive floods were triggered by a cloudburst over a mountain lake this week, where they were worsened after water was released from a nearby dam into the Tista River. It destroyed the power infrastructure at the Chatang Dam before moving downstream flooding towns and villages in the area. Hundreds of search and rescue personnel have been deployed across Sikkim and in the northern parts of the neighboring West Bengal state, which is downstream. The Thai government has announced a compensation of 6.2 million baht, and that's about 167,000 US dollars to the families of each victim of a deadly shooting at Luxury Mall, which happened earlier this week. Two people were killed, both foreign nationals from China and Myanmar, and five were wounded when a teenager opened fire in a luxury mall in Bangkok on Tuesday. At the same news conference, the head of Thailand's tourism authority said the government is concerned that the incident will have an impact on the number of Chinese tourists traveling to Thailand. China is vital to that effort as the biggest source of foreign visitors to Thailand in pre-COVID years. Thai police have also vowed to crack down on the legal trade of firearms. Just after that arrest of four men suspected of selling modified firearms to the teenage suspects involved in Tuesday's shooting. Let's head to San Francisco when a memorial service has held at the City Hall to honor the life and legacy of U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who passed away at her home in Washington, D.C. on September the 29th at the age of 90. The event was attended by numerous notable politicians, including U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the former U.S. House Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, as well as Alian Mariano, Senator Feinstein's granddaughter. The U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris took the stage highlighting Senator's role in advancing the rights of women in America. As a public servant, Diane had the courage to take on the many tough fights, even when she was faced with fierce opposition and political peril, and especially when her work was in defense of the Constitution and the security of the American people. Diane commanded respect, and she gave respect. She was a serious and gracious person who welcomed debate and discussion, but always required that it would be well-informed and studied. Diane, the women of America have come a long way. Our country has come a long way. And you helped move the ball forward. And our nation salutes you, Diane. Behind us. 
The stunning Al Wasil Dome in Expo City, Dubai, has been awarded a Guinness World Record as the world's largest interactive dome during a spectacular public event. The Al Wasil, which means connection in Arabic, features an incredible sensory display across its vast surface. It uses laser light projections and computer generated content to provide visitors with a truly unique interactive experience. Guests can use a tablet with augmented reality features to morph and shape the 360-degree projection with their fingertips. The dome was designed by Chicago-based company Adrian Smith plus Gordon Gale Architecture and it is expected to host live concerts and performances. The World Guinness Record awarded us with the largest interactive dome with uh, a space of 24,000 square meter. And uh, it's basically how can you touch the dome? How can you be the master of El Wasl Plaza and she obeys to you? So people would come on stage and try on the iPad, um, uh, touching the iPad in a way that the dome interacts with you. So if someone touches it towards the right, all the voices and sounds and the panels on the dome flips into uh, jewels and it really uh, interacts with what the visitor wants. This was a test uh, of uh, what could happen with Al Wasl Plaza. And January onwards, you will be able to control Al Wasl from your phone in Al Wasl Plaza and touch the dome. Today, we are at Al Wasl Plaza in Expo City, Dubai, to adjudicate the Guinness World Records title, largest immersive interactive dome. The size of the dome is 24,038 meters squared, making Expo City Dubai the new Guinness World Records record title holder for the largest interactive immersive dome. Well, there will always be something new to see in Dubai. And that's also the beauty of technology. And on that beautiful note, we end the world today for this week. Thank you so much for watching all through the week. Have a wonderful weekend. I'm Anne Wawadu.